in this lecture, we'll be talking about archaea and some of the cell structures that they have, including their cell envelope and how it differs from the bacterial cell wall and cell envelope, as well as some appendages that are specific to archaea called cannula and heme. So archaea are kind of similar to both eukaryotes and bacteria. And so members of this particular domain, um, when we look at their genes, we notice that they have some genes for information storage um, that are similar to eukaryotes, and they have genes for metabolism that are more similar to those genes in bacteria. Um, and the group of archaea as a whole, this domain, is um, morphologically diverse, so they look very different from each other. They're biochemically diverse. They can do a lot of different things with their uh, chemical reactions, and they're ecologically diverse, which means they can um, live in a variety of different environments. Um, we commonly refer to archaea as the extremophiles, mostly based on this ecological diversity. They can live in very extreme environments, including super high temperatures, super high salt concentrations, um, and um, they actually enjoy living in those environments. So you can actually see some different examples of archaeal cells over here on the right. And you can see some of that morphological or structural um, kind of diversity in the group of archaea. So even though um, archaea are different from each other, they're very diverse, um, they all do share a commonality in that they do not have any peptidoglycan in their cell walls. So archaea do have cell walls just like bacteria do, um, but we know that bacterial cell walls are mainly made of peptidoglycan. Um, this molecule does not exist in any archaeal cell wall. Um, that said, archaea cell walls can vary in their structure, and you can see kind of three different possible compositions of cell wall structure over here on the right. Uh, the most common cell wall structure for an archaea is what's known as an S layer, which sits on the outside of the plasma membrane of an archaeal cell and is made mostly of a mixture of glycoproteins and regular proteins. So rather than peptidoglycan, which is carbohydrate, um, these S layers are mostly composed of protein. Interestingly, one, um, some archaea have what we refer to as a pseudo cell wall that is um, made of this molecule called pseudomurine. And if we look over here, this is the structure of pseudomurine. It has two carbohydrates up top and another chain of carbohydrates on the bottom. And these chains of carbohydrates are linked together with these peptide crosslinks. And if you looked quickly, um, and you're not a super expert on organic chemistry, as I am not, you would think that this pseudomurine molecule looks a lot like peptidoglycan, and it does. And so this sort of argues that earlier in um, evolution, archaea actually developed a similar molecule to create cell walls that bacteria did. And these two occurrences would argue that this type of molecule might be a good way to make a cell wall because it evolved both in domain archaea and domain bacteria. But once again, this is not peptidoglycan. Archaea cell walls don't actually have true peptidoglycan in them at all. And so if we move inward in an archaeal cell in terms of anatomy, we move to the plasma membrane. And there are some differences um, between archaeal plasma membranes and those membranes of bacteria, one of which is that they contain these branched chains of a molecule called isoprene rather than chains of fatty acids. So here you can see uh, the molecules that we would typically find in an archaeal cell membrane versus a bacterial cell membrane. These are the phospholipid molecules. So here's the phosphate group on either one of them. Here's the glycerol molecule in both of them. And then we usually think about fatty acid tails being the other component of the phospholipids in a bacterial or eukaryotic cell membrane. 
but our keel cells have these special isoprene chains rather than fatty acid chains. Additionally, the linkages between the chains and the glycerol molecules in these phospholipids are different between um, archaea and bacteria. Archaea have ether linkages. You can see that here. That's just one carbon bonded to oxygen, whereas bacteria have ester linkages that link these chains to the glycerol molecule. And so this is a lot of chemistry. But ultimately, what this does for our keel plasma membranes in the big picture is it actually makes them more resistant to high temperatures or heat, as well as to low pH or acidic conditions. So the chemistry of these isoprene chains and the chemistry of these ether linkages, as opposed to fatty acid chains and ester linkages, are what provides the resistance that allow archaea to survive effectively in the extreme environments that they live in, whether it's high heat or high acidity, high salt. Additionally, uh, we just generally think about plasma membranes in our cells and bacterial cells as phospholipid bilayers, but some archaea can actually have plasma membranes that are not made up of two layers or bilayers, but are actually a single layer or a monolayer. So here we can see a bilayer on the right where there's two layers of phospholipids with the tails pointing inward at each other. But in some cases, archaea have something that looks more like this on the left where they have long chains of isoprenes that are connected and there's only one single layer in the plasma membrane. And you can see that monolayer here in a little bit more detail on the left versus a bilayer on the right. And this monolayer structure also provides some more protection against the heat and acidic conditions that these archaea live in. In terms of what's going on on the inside of an archaeal cell, <coughs> they are quite similar to bacteria. They don't have a nucleus. They're considered prokaryotic, but they do have an area where they store their DNA called the nucleoid region, just like bacteria do. They have a circular double-stranded DNA chromosome, just like bacteria do. However, they have histone proteins, which are something that is seen in eukaryotic cells like our cells, but is usually not seen in bacteria, which is kind of interesting. Archaea have very similar ribosomes to bacteria. They use the same types of RNA to make those ribosomes. They have compartments or inclusions that can store things like sugars and glycogen, as well as gases, and they have cytoskeletal proteins that help maintain their structure. And so overall, the archaeal cell interior is very similar to bacterial cell interior. Archaea also have appendages that extend outward from their cell envelope or cell wall. They have pili, which allow them to attach to surfaces, just like pili allow bacteria to attach to surfaces. But the structure of their pili isn't really well understood and hasn't been studied very well. They, um, archaea also have flagella. They are thinner than bacterial flagella, and they're also not hollow. So we talked about the flagella structure of a bacteria being kind of a tube or a cylinder. That's not the case for uh, archaeal flagella. They are actually just one solid mass of protein. <coughs> they're made of multiple different types of flagellin proteins. rather than just one, as in bacteria, and they grow a little bit differently. So rather than growing, extending outward from the tip to grow in length, they're actually growing from kind of the bottom. Subunits of flagellin are added in here into the filament, and then the filament extends outward rather than growing at the tip. There's no basal bodies. Um, or no structure that actually helps attach the flagella into the cell wall in archaea as there is in bacteria, <laughs> but they do use their flagella for the same purpose that bacteria use theirs for, which is motility or movement. They don't use the same type of energy to drive this movement, 
Bacterial flagella use proton motive force to cause this filament area to spin and power that movement. Um, archaea use ATP hydrolysis to power their flagella to spin and cause movement for them. So one additional structure that's specific to archaea and not seen in bacteria are these structures called hemi, um, which is the plural version of hemis. These structures are made up of protein and they're extremely, extremely strong and stable. And they have almost a grappling hook structure like the hooks used for rock climbing. They extend outward from the cell envelope and they have these little hook structures at the end. <coughs> and their main function is to help archaea attach to surfaces as well as attach to each other. And so if you look at these images here, they're showing electron microscope pictures of these hundreds and hundreds of hemi that extend out past the S layer in an archaeal cell out into the environment. And they have a specific region here called the prickle region, which has a couple of little barbs coming off of it. And then they end in this hook region where their grappling hook structure can be seen. And you can actually see it here as well. There's the plasma membrane of an archaeal cell. Here's a hemi coming out. In this image here, you can actually see one, two, three grappling hook structures. And these, as I said, are mostly for attachment of archaea to surfaces to hold them in place. And another interesting thing that archaea can do is they actually have these hollow tube-like structures that extend outward from their S layer called cannulae. And cannulae are, as I said, hollow, and they're much wider than flagella, and they can extend extremely long, up to 40 millimeters, which for um, a microscopic cell is extremely long. Um, they're specific to certain types of archaea, particularly the thermophiles, the one that like the ones that like high heat. And they happen to mostly arise while those cells are dividing. So it's thought that their function can be to connect cells to each other and help anchor them to surfaces as well. But there's also a hypothesis that there is a role for cannulae to allow transport of materials from one archaeal cell to another because they do have these hollow tube structures um, it's hypothesized that things can actually be passed from one cell to another through a cannula.